be satisfied with nothing but going to sea. My inclination to this led me so strongly against the will, nay, commands of my father, and against all the entreaties and persuasions of my mother, that there seemed to be something fatal in that propension of nature tending directly to the life of misery which was to befall me. My father, a wise and brave man, gave me serious and excellent counsel against what he foresaw as my design. He told me it was men of desperate fortunes on one hand, or of superior fortunes on the other, who went abroad upon adventures, aspiring to rise by enterprise and make themselves famous in undertaking of nature out of the common road. These things were all either too far above me or too far below me. I hardly know where to begin. So many years at sea, so many stories, and now so little time. I am nearly 40 years old. In my short life, I have sailed half the world on voyages of exploration. I have discovered unknown coasts and charted an entire continent. I have been stricken with scurvy, shipwrecked, and imprisoned. I have seen good men die. And for what? I am haunted by the ignominy of failure. I, I fear I have become like Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, a castaway, a castaway of history. So, where to begin? My name is Matthew Flinders. I was born in the Lincolnshire village of Donington on the 16th of March, 1774. And I was 16 when I first went to sea, much to the dismay of my father, whom I suspect had always hoped that I might study to become a man of medicine like him. Instead, I signed on as a midshipman in ships of His Majesty's Navy, first with Captain Thomas Paisley and the Scipio and the Bellerophon, and then with the notorious Captain William Bly, in whose ship, the Providence, I voyaged to the Pacific, following in the wake of his previous ship, the ill-fated Bounty. Two years later, I rejoined the Bellerophon in time to fight in the sea battle against the French off Brest that was to become renowned as the glorious 1st of June. Those early years were my apprenticeship as a seaman, and by the time I was 21 and promoted to the rank of master's mate aboard the Reliance under the command of Captain Henry Waterhouse, I was already an accomplished navigator and cartographer. On the 5th of February, 1795, the Reliance sailed from England for the new British settlement at Port Jackson, on the edge of the great southern continent known as Terra Australis. During the long voyage out, I became acquainted with a ship's surgeon, who, as it happened, was also from Lincolnshire. George Bass was three years older than me, he shared my youthful enthusiasm for adventure and cared little for the tedium of regular naval service. We became fast friends. The beginning of that friendship is perhaps the real beginning of my story. At the end of October 1795, while the Reliance was undergoing a refit at Port Jackson, George Bass and I, and Bass's young servant Martin, decided to set out for Botany Bay in a small skiff that Bass brought out from England. The skiff was aptly named Tom Thumb. We had heard from local kangaroo hunters of uncharted rivers that flowed into the bay. To explore one of these rivers seemed to us a worthwhile object of a boat expedition. 
although we knew from the outset that it would hardly be a voyage of great discovery. More an enjoyable escapade. The very strangeness of this coast enthralled me from the moment I first sighted it from the deck of the Reliance. And during the week we explored the shallower reaches of the bay in the Tom Thumb, before finding our way to the entrance of the Georges River. I busied myself with sketches of the wind-carved outcrops of sandstone, the pale orange sand flats edged with impenetrable mangroves, and the grey twisted branches of the eucalyptus trees that shaded the sheltered waters of the bay. Even now, I sometimes think of that Australian landscape somehow animate, beckoning, and how it was to draw me back for the rest of my naval career. We followed the river's winding course for miles, some way beyond where a previous survey by the governor, John Hunter, had been carried. The sketches I made of the river's upper reaches together with Bass's report on the rich land surrounding it induced Governor Hunter to examine the area further. Two years later, he established a small settlement there, giving it the name of Bankstown, after the man who was to become the patron of my later voyages, the botanist Sir Joseph Banks. Our duties aboard the Reliance kept Bass and me occupied for the next five months. But we continued to plan another boat expedition, this time to the coast some miles south of Botany Bay, where we hoped we would find the entrance of a large river said to fall into the sea. We sailed out of Port Jackson, Bass, Faithful Martin and I, on the 25th of March, 1796, and standing a little off to sea, found a strong south-going current to carry us on our way. By the afternoon of our second day, we were still at sea and our supply of water was running low. We sighted a place where, although we could not beach the boat safely, one of us could swim ashore to fill a cask. Of course, it was Bass, ever foolhardy, who went over the side. It was a mistake. No sooner was Bass ashore than the surf rose and began driving the boat in towards the beach. Our arms, ammunition and provisions were drenched and partly spoiled and by the time we emptied the boat and launched her again, it was late in the afternoon. The next morning, while exploring the steep rocky shores of a small island, we encountered two natives who offered to pilot us to a river which, they said, lay a few miles further southward and where not only fresh water was abundant, but also fish and wild ducks. Their river proved to be nothing more than a small stream which descended from a lagoon to force a passage for itself through the beach. Entering the stream, 
We soon became aware that we were surrounded by a large number of natives and we began to entertain doubts of securing a retreat from the creek should they turn hostile. As it turned out, we were able to appease their curiosity about us. And although we remained watchful, we were allowed to go about our business unmolested. Two days later, after rowing hard against the prevailing northerly wind, we were four leagues nearer home. Nearer home, but not yet dry. We eventually found the river which was our original destination, and named it after the pilot from whom we first heard of it, Henry Hacking. Two days later, having found nowhere accessible to a ship beyond two miles from Port Hacking's entrance, nor any prospect of increasing our stock of provisions, we sailed back to Port Jackson. The Tom Thumb voyages accomplished little in terms of new knowledge about the coast south of Port Jackson, but they did at least draw Governor Hunter's attention to the names of a pair of otherwise unremarkable young naval men, Bass and Flinders. In early December of the following year, 1797, while I was on a voyage to Norfolk Island aboard the Reliance, George Bass was sent south by the Governor on a much longer boat journey. With a crew of six hand-picked seamen, he spent three and a half months exploring the unknown southeast coast of the continent in a 28-foot whaleboat. Unfortunately, my friend was more enthusiastic than skilled as a navigator. His rough eye sketch of the bay he was to name Western Port was in error some 13 miles of latitude and 86 miles of longitude. <laughs> Nonetheless, he returned convinced that a strait between that stretch of coast and Van Diemen's land must exist. So it was that in October 1798, I was given my first command, a small ship named the Norfolk. And together with George Bass and a crew of eight, I sailed south from Port Jackson with instructions from Governor Hunter to investigate whether, in fact, a strait did exist. We rounded the north coast of Van Diemen's land in the second week of December. A few days afterwards, we had reached the coast's northwesternmost cape, a desolate promontory we didn't hesitate to name Cape Grimm. By then, both Bass and I were certain that Van Diemen's land was indeed what we had always suspected, a large island. My dearest Anne, my imagination has flown to you often and many a time. This seems to be a very critical period of my life. I have long been absent, have done services abroad that were not expected, but which seem to be thought a good deal of. 
I have more and greater friends than before, and this seems to be the moment that their exertions may be the most serviceable to me. I may now perhaps make a bold dash forward or remain a poor lieutenant all my life. I met Anne Chapel, the stepdaughter of a Lincolnshire parson, just before setting sail for Port Jackson aboard the Reliance. I had written to her occasionally during my early years at sea, but never, I admit, with quite the ardour of that letter of the 25th of September, 1800. I was then at the Nore, on the southeast coast of England, where the Reliance was at anchor after a long and gruelling voyage home from New Holland. I had been at sea for six years. I was no longer a callow boy, but an ambitious and accomplished young man intent on becoming, to coin a phrase from Robinson Crusoe, famous in undertakings of nature out of the common road. Indeed, I, I had already taken the bold step of writing at length to Sir Joseph Banks, proposing a plan to explore and survey the still extensively unknown coasts of the continent, generally referred to as Terra Australis, and offering my own services as a commander for such an exploration. The timing of my letter could not have been more opportune. The French government was known to be dispatching ships under the command of Captain Nicolas Baudin to explore the coast west of Bass's Strait, so it was now imperative that a British ship also make discoveries on this coast. Two months later, I was given the command of His Majesty's ship the Investigator, a converted collier 100 feet in length with a beam of 28 feet. My orders were to refit her and with a generous contribution from the proprietors of the East India Company provision her for a four-year voyage of exploration. My long dreamt of voyage was at last about to begin but I was overtaken by deep sorrow and regret. Only three months earlier I had married my beloved Anne Chapel fully intending to take her with me. What a young fool I was for a time, I truly imagined that my stern patrons, Sir Joseph and their Lordships of the Admiralty, would allow Anne to join me aboard. Instead, they demanded that she be left behind. I was heartbroken. Our love would have to wait. At dawn on the 18th of July, 1801, the investigator weighed anchor off Spithead and sailed with the tide out into the English Channel. Eighty-three men made up the ship's complement of crew, among them my brother Samuel, now a lieutenant, along with a scientific party of six. The voyage to Terra Australis took nearly five months, during which the investigator lived up to her reputation as the worst ship that could be met with. It was with some relief that after sighting Cape Lowen on the 6th of December, we found a sheltered anchorage in one of the harbours of King George Sound. My dearest Anne, how keenly I feel your absence. We have been at sea for a little more than a week of the new year and have been working our way northeastwards close inshore along a barren, almost featureless shore that, were it not so hot and dust swept, might remind me of one of the low shores of the Lincolnshire Fens. I have never felt so far from home nor so lonely as I do at this moment.
We were deep within the vast gulf I was to name the Great Australian Bight. For days we tacked along its exposed and desolate shores past steep, treeless headlands blown with dust. Then we came upon an unbroken line of sandstone cliffs so high that nothing of the interior country could be seen above them that I thought later they might even be the narrow barrier between an interior and exterior sea. On the morning of the 22nd of February 1802, whilst the investigator lay at anchor off an island at the entrance to a large body of water, I was later to name Spencer's Gulf, I sent Mr. Thistle, the sailing master, with eight men in a cutter to look for a mainland anchorage where water might be found and taken on board. Neither he nor his crew were ever seen again. Poor Thistle, I would come to miss him desperately. HMS investigator Matthew Flinders, commander, anchored here February the 22nd, 1802. Mr. John Thistle, the master, Mr. William Taylor, midshipman, and six of the crew were unfortunately drowned near this place from being upset in a boat. The wreck of the boat was found, but their bodies were not recovered. The loss of my men had affected me deeply and for a while I longed for the comfort of my home in Lincolnshire. The names I gave to features on this coast reflect my homesickness. Cape Donington, Boston Bay, Stamford Hill, Grantham Island, all of them recall my native country. My dearest Anne, a moment snatched from the confusion of performing half a dozen occupations is a poor tribute to offer a beloved friend like thee amidst my various and constant occupations. Thou art not one day forgotten. As on other parts of the coast, I was aware of the presence of local natives. They were wary of us, and I could well understand their fear. What would be the conduct of any people, ourselves for instance, were we living in a state of nature, ignorant of the existence of any other nations, on the arrival of strangers so different in complexion and appearance to ourselves, having power to transport themselves over, even living upon an element which to us was impossible? Well, the first sensation would probably be terror. The first movement, flight. Such seemed to be the conduct of these Australians. Australians. I suppose I can rightly claim to be the first to call the continent's Aborigines Australians. Not that it's for me or any man to name another, even benevolently. Leaving Port Lincoln, we spent a month following different coasts into shallow dead ends in a vain search for an entrance to an inland sea or a strait that might lead us to the Gulf of Carpentaria. Instead, I discovered and charted a pair of deep gulfs that I named Spencer's Gulf 
and the Gulf of St. Vincent. Log, April 8th. Saw something ahead which was first taken for a pyramid rock. It was Captain Baudin's own ship, Le Geographie. Never was there a day during the months we had sailed along this coast that I was not burdened by the dread that the French expedition might have already discovered substantial parts of it before me. As it was, Baudin, a man whose skills as a captain and a hydrographer I did not greatly admire, had claimed some 300 miles of the coast northeast of where our ships came upon each other, in a bay east of the Gulf of St. Vincent that I named Encounter Bay. Other British ships, too, were making discoveries on this coast. One of them, the Lady Nelson, under the command of Lieutenant John Murray, was the first to enter the large inlet later named Port Phillip, although it was left to me to make the most extensive survey aboard the investigator. By the end of April 1802, with the onset of the southern winter only a few months away and my ship's provisions running low, I resolved to hurry northwards to Port Jackson to prepare for the next, longer and more perilous leg of my survey. My beloved husband, forgive me that thou hast no word received from me these many weeks, but only now am I beginning to overcome the anguish that thy so sudden abandonment of me at Portsmouth did cause. O oh, Matthew, to follow so determinedly the call of thy profession was such poor proof of thine affection for me. I long for thy company all the more now that autumn is upon us. Indeed, there are still deer to be seen grazing at the edge of the woods here at Bardney. How hard it is to imagine that thou mayst be reading this in the warmth of what soon will be summer in that strange, distant continent. I pray daily for thy safe arrival at the colony of Port Jackson. From the moment we dropped anchor on the 9th of May, 1802, the settlement's governor, P.G. King, took pains to provide my ship with all the assistance the meager resources of the settlement would allow. The investigator remained in Port Jackson for two and a half months, undergoing a complete refit, as well as taking on stores and victuals, and signing on new crew, nine of them conditionally emancipated convicts. We weighed anchor on the 22nd of July, 1803, and in company with the Lady Nelson, a smaller shallow draft vessel placed under my orders by Governor King, sailed northwards. We were following now in the wake of the great Captain James Cook, who aboard the Endeavour already discovered and charted much of this coast 30 years before. I was therefore keen to make haste to reach the Gulf of Carpentaria and begin surveying its still unknown shores before the wet season set in. We entered the Gulf on the 3rd of November, 1802. I, I could barely contain my excitement. This coast had not been surveyed by Europeans since the Dutchman William Janssen and Lodwig Chusen van Rosengen landed there 150 years before to become the first Europeans ever to set foot on the continent. Beloved Matthew, thou hast been absent from me nigh on fifteen months, and yet how desperately I still yearn for thee. As ever, I am anxious of the many perils that must lie before thee. I know no word of mine can prevent thee from carrying forth that which is in thine heart and mind to achieve. So I must pray that God's protection rest on thee and upon those he has entrusted to thy governance. Thy faithful wife, Amen. By now, though, 
the investigator was in a bad state, leaking as much as 10 inches an hour and seeming literally to rot beneath us. Against my better judgment, I pressed on for another two months. The weather was hot and very humid and mosquitoes and flies were a constant nuisance. And then one by one, the men began to die. On New Year's Day 1803, we lost a man drowned. A week later, a master's mate was stabbed by a native. Another seaman died of sunstroke. And finally, there was an outbreak of scurvy. My despair was total. On the 16th of March, I was forced to concede defeat and abandon my survey. We reached Port Jackson three months later, sailing via the northwest cape of the island continent to complete a circumnavigation of it. By then, though, nearly all my men were afflicted with scurvy or dysentery, and four died in hospital ashore. I was to receive more bad news. A letter from my mother informed me of my father's death the year before at the age of 52. My dearest mother, the death of so kind a father, so excellent a man, is a heavy blow and strikes deep into my heart. The duty I owed him and which I had now a prospect of paying with the warmest affection and gratitude, had he looked forward to the time of my return with increased ardor. One of my fondest hopes is now destroyed. Oh, my dearest, kindest father, how much I loved and revered you, you cannot now know. There was no point in staying on in Port Jackson. All I could hope for now was to be given a new ship in England to complete the survey. So, with the approval of Governor King, I set sail for home on the 10th of August as a passenger on His Majesty's ship, the Porpoise. I should have already realized then that my fortune, so reliably good in my youth, had turned against me. Two weeks out of Port Jackson, the Porpoise, in company with two other ships, was shipwrecked on an unmarked reef far off the southern perimeter of the Great Barrier Reef. I survived unharmed, so did my charts and papers. I took command of the band of castaways and piloted a small cutter across 700 miles of open sea to reach help at Port Jackson. Then, after leading a rescue convoy back to the reef as the newly appointed commander of another ship, the Cumberland, I continued my homeward journey. But my bad fortunes worsened. On the 4th of December, 1803, the Cumberland was beset by a severe gale in the Indian Ocean. For two days, the ship labored in heavy seas. Eventually, the pumps lost pace with the leaks. With water and provisions perilously low, I decided to run for shelter at the Ile de France. I was unaware until it was too late that a renewed state of war existed between England and France. I was to become an unwitting invader of a hostile port. Even now, it is hard to accept that six years of my life were wasted in imprisonment on the Ile de France. And I still maintain a bitter hatred for the man who ordered it, the Governor General, Charles Mathieu Isidore de Caen.
Perhaps if I had been less pompous, less self-righteous, less certain of my own reputation when dealing with the man. But damn him! He, he, he as much as called me a liar and a spy, dismissing all the evidence I could offer as to my identity and my pressing reasons to call at his port. And when I refused to cower, he ordered that my ship be seized, my papers confiscated, and my crew detained aboard a prison ship. And from then on, I was to be kept ashore in a series of house arrests. My ill will towards de Caen softened in, in the later years of my detention. <laughs> I, I even remember writing to him, I entreat your excellency to consider that I am a man of peace. My business is not to destroy, but to add to the knowledge of one part of mankind and alleviate the miseries of another. Trim, Trim my cat a companion more constant than any wife during those many years at sea, was lost in the first year of my imprisonment. Gradually, the rest of my crew were released and allowed to leave the island. Even my faithful servant, John Elder, accepting that I could no longer count on ever leaving the island, he went home. I was left alone with only a melancholic hope to sustain me. I was at last released on the 13th of June, 1810, three years after the French government order to do so was received by de Caen. I set foot in England for the first time in nine years on the 23rd of October and reunited with my beloved Anne. And this, this has been my sentence these past three years in England. The account of my voyages around the continent I will insist on calling Australia. I have been given neither promotion due me nor any worthwhile stipend during its writing. I have been shunned by those who in the past have had some interest in my investigations. By now, this sentence too is over. And for the first time, Australia can assume its proper place and its proper shape in the world, bestowed with a name befitting it. If nothing else, I have accomplished this. So here I am, preparing for a longer journey. Than all, all these, have. having lived a life of infinite variety and learned sufficiently to know the value of retirement and blessing of ending one's days. Matthew Flinders died in the early hours of the 19th of July, 1814, in his rooms in London. Anne outlived him by 38 years, surviving together with a young daughter on a small annuity from Flinders' estate and a naval widow's pension. In a letter to Sir Joseph Banks, Flinders once wrote, I have too much ambition to rest in the unnoticed middle order of mankind. Since neither birth nor fortune have favored me, my actions shall speak to the world. I cannot rival the immortalized name of Cook, yet if persevering industry joined to what ability I might possess can accomplish it, then I shall secure the second place. He secured much more, and in the history of Australia, the names of Flinders and Cook must stand with equal stature.